Hello and welcome back. So in this class, we are uh, going to look at uh, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, uh, specifically the physics of MRI. And in the next video, we will look at you know some of the um, image acquisition uh, techniques as well as the hardware required for uh, magnetic resonance imaging systems. Okay. So here is the outline. Um, we are going to look at a brief introduction to uh, the origin of uh, you know uh, magnetization uh, in, in in the sample. Uh, we'll understand how the individual uh, spins, so-called spins, are uh, interact with the uh, external static electric field. We'll understand terminologies related to transverse and longitudinal magnetization, and then we'll uh, look at the origin of the MR signal, that the one that is used for actually uh, putting together uh, the uh, images that you see from an MR scanner. Okay, okay. so microscopic magnetization. Okay. So every nuclei has both charge and the so-called spin angular momentum. Now the spin angular momentum is actually uh, an intrinsic property of the nuclei and uh, it has no counterpart in classical physics in the sense that the, the idea of spin originates from quantum mechanics but we will not go into the details of how it came about. I just understand that uh, you know in addition to charge uh, the nuclei also have this uh, spin uh, property. And this is the property that leads, uh, gives rise to uh, ma the magnetism. So each nuclei, basically once with atomic um, odd atomic number or mass number, they possess something called the spin angular momentum. We denote that by phi. Okay. Uh, the spin angular momentum gives rise to uh, magnetic properties. That's that's the one that gives. That's the one that interacts with the external magnetic field. Uh, the microscopic magnetic field um, has a magnetic moment associated with it that primarily comes from the spin and that's that moment vector we denote by mu which is gamma times a phi. This gamma is known as the gyromagnetic ratio and it can be measured for different type of nuclei. Okay? So the gyromagnetic ratio has units of radians per second per tesla. Sometimes you also you will also see this notation which is nothing but gamma bar which is gamma by 2 pi okay now i'm i'm, I'm kind of going to abuse notation and use uh, gamma and gamma bar inter interchangeably but wherever required i'll try to mention that and you can uh, you know put the appropriate uh, symbol again uh, this class is just to understand you know some uh, at a qualitative level how uh, mr images are produced and also understand the mechanisms of contrast so that's where we are actually headed right okay so the uh, macroscopic magnetization uh, comes from you know all these individual spins. So if you can think of a system of spins, right? So uh, basically, if you look at our body, uh, we have a lot of uh, water in our body is mostly water. So there's a lot of hydrogen um, atoms in there, mostly protons. So they are the they are the overwhelming uh, contribution to the spin, right? So uh, in the absence of any uh, external magnetic field, all these spins are randomly oriented. Okay. So, you can think of these spins like a compass needle, right? So something like something like this that are oriented in random directions. Okay. And um, so, uh, these, these were randomly oriented spins cancel each other out leading to a net bulk magnetization or macroscopic magnetization. Okay. But in the presence of a static magnetic field, let us say along the z axis, so without loss of generality, we can always assume that uh, if, we ask, if we apply a static magnetic field, it will be a, that the um, direction of that magnetic field is, a, is the z-axis. So, uh, uh, the uh, magnetization uh, vector is actually a vector, so is the magnetic field is also a vector, right. Um, and in that case, what happens when there is a static applied magnetic field, there is a preferred orientation of spins, okay, along the direction of the applied field, okay. And if you, and this leads to a net magnetization, which we can write in this form, which is basically the sum of individual nuclear magnetic moments. Okay, in a sample. Okay, you can think of this as a vector sum rather than a scale sum. Okay, think of it as a vector sum. Now, um, there is actually an expression for this. So, if you leave the sample, a particular sample, in a static magnetic B0 field uh, long enough, that is for a certain period of time, because it takes time for all the mag individual magnetic spins to orient along the direction, or in this case, actually, um, you know, if uh, from the quantum mechanics point of view, the spins generally align either along or opposite to the direction. Okay, that's a possibility. But we won't analyze it that way. We'll get to that uh, analysis later. So right now, we say it's just that we have an expression for the M0. But what is more important here is that the M0 depends on the strength of the applied static magnetic field, which is B0. It also depends on this PD. PD is nothing but the proton density. 
proton density. In this case, the proton we are talking about is the hydrogen atom proton. Okay. So basically, we the, the which we now know have an idea of what we, you know the kind of signal that is produced, which the, the signal produced depends on actually we will see later that the signal produced depends on m0 which in turn depends on uh, this applied magnetic field as well as the density of protons okay so uh, this magnetization is what is induced by the uh, presence of by the presence of a static magnetic field and we are considering a sample let's say in this case the human body or a piece of tissue okay um, but this magnetization it turns out is just not a uh, static it is actually a function of time and it's also it need not be homogeneous also right in the sense it is it's also the spatially dependent okay as so at least in nmr experiments that will all, that will all, that is what will happen so this m0 or m i will call it will be a function of space as well as time okay now we will define one other quantity just for the sake of you know analysis see there is a bulk angular momentum that we can define so remember that we have for every individual um, you know uh, nuclei we, we said there is something called a spin uh, angular momentum. So, we can also say for the sample itself there is a bulk, bulk angular momentum j and it is related to the magnetization of the sample through this expression where again once again this gamma is the aeromagnetic ratio. Okay. Um, so, in this case now we are like just to clarify we are always talking about a sample uh, when I say sample it is basically a piece of tissue or a human body in a static magnetic field. Okay. Now, uh, before we analyze you know where the signal comes from just have to keep in mind there are three factors we will we'll eventually find out there are the three factors which contribute to the contrast in an MR image. Okay? The appearance of an MR image is influenced by these three, uh, th three factors. One is called T1, these are relaxation times T1, T2 and the proton density. Okay? In addition to this, how these contrasts vary, whether the T1 contrast is higher, T2 contrast is higher or PD is higher is determined by so called pulse sequence. Okay? And we will see what that is also in its later slides. The pulse sequence determines which one of these contrasts um, is, is kind of contributing more to the image. Okay. All right. So, what happens um, uh, when you apply a uh, static magnetic field? So, now we know that there is a spin angular momentum uh, for individual nuclei and there is also this bulk angular momentum J and so what happens is that the rate, the, that rate there is a torque induced and the torque a torque induced on the, which is which is depend which depends on the uh, uh, static magnetic field. So now, if you have um, studied some high school physics or 12th standard physics, you have seen that if there is a current carrying loop and you put that in a magnetic field, you know it experiences a torque. It's very similar to that. The rate of change of angular momentum, which is the torque, which is dj by dt, this is the torque that you are usually talking about, is basically the cross product of the magnetization and the applied static magnetic field. Okay, this comes from you know you must have uh, seen this in. Uh, plus 1 or plus 2 physics where you see basic electromagnetism from there we can write this expression towards it m cross b dj by dt is m cross b now the why and why do we need this because this actually gives you like the equations of motion so to speak of of the individual of the magnetization vector itself okay now um, so the j we know that is a is the angular momentum vector associated with the magnetization m so m is gamma j so you can always substitute there okay and also we know that bt can always be aligned with the positive z direction so we will always say bt by b0 okay um, so right now this b0 is a static magnetic field there is no uh, this particular b0 uh, as in as as it is applied in a mr scanner doesn't depend is actually quite homogeneous and it doesn't vary with time the b0 field as it's called which is typically the direction along which we apply it to be z axis so that that doesn't change okay so then we can always say bt is b0 and we also substitute uh, instead of gamma, uh, instead of uh, j, we will substitute m. So why do we do this? Because see, we want what we want to do in when we do MR imaging is we want to map this m, okay? And this m in terms de depends on we saw it, uh, you know, uh, b zero. We also saw it depends on pd, and the other two factors, uh, the the other two factors that can be controlled, that can be brought into brought to bear on the contrast is also the t one and t two relaxation times. Okay? So all of this. Um, are expressed through this m this is what we are trying to measure right and this we want to measure as a function of space and time and this that's why we want to write this equation this dj by dt in terms of the magnetization okay now if we solve this that differential equation right this differential equation if you solve for the magnetization remember we can always put um, uh, uh, m equal to gamma j and substitute here and when we solve this equation we see this we'll get the following solution okay so we won't go into the details of how it's solved etc it's a straightforward ODE so you can solve it 
So we can see that there are three components. So M is a vector, remember. It's a vector. Magnetization, induced magnetization is a vector. So this has three, it will have three components, Mx, My and Mz. Okay. And we see that they evolve according to, if you see that Mx and My, there is a sinusoidal dependence okay, with respect to time. Right. And the frequency we will see as the frequency depends this gamma B0 we will see is that is something called the Larmor frequency. I will mention that in the subsequent slides. So you, from this equation you see that M, this the Mx and N, My components are um, you know, in this case periodic. Right. So which means that there is a, a precession happening in the XY. So we'll, uh, we will I will illustrate this in the later slides. Okay. So let us look at this. So this uh, based on this equation we saw that this omega 0 is gamma B0 is called the Larmor frequency and as units of radiance per second and of course we can always rewrite this as mu, uh, nu 0 is gamma B0 divided by 2 pi and we can uh, rewrite the equations we saw in the previous slide in this form. Okay. So what is this motion? This is similar to that of a top or a gyroscope in a gravitational field and in this case the axis of the top is the direction of m which basically the direction of the magnetization is same as the axis of the top and the z axis is the direction of the stat, uh, which is the direction of the you know acceleration due to gravity uh, in this case is the direction of the static magnetic field okay so this this these two equations um, you know uh, refer to means that there is a precession okay around z which is the same as the direction of the b0 field okay around the z axis so there is a precession um, of this uh, of this magnetization in the x uh, around the direction of the applied static electric field. Yes, uh, applied static magnetic field. Sorry, I said electric field was a mistake. So um, uh, this this is just basically this this e these two equations denote a precession around that direction, right? Because you remember, if you look at this, you know the, the y, uh, m x and m y are they, they are kind of periodic or this case sinusoidal motion. Okay, so. Um, once again, what this Larmor frequency we saw is actually dependent on the uh, it's um, the ferromagnetic ratio times B zero. B zero is the applied static magnetic field. Now there are three sources of the static magnetic field fluctuations. One is there is inhomogeneity itself with the hardware itself. You know you cannot exactly you know have B zero everywhere in you know especially. So there are going to be some fluctuations there. Uh, there is there are two other properties intrinsic properties of the sample which is the magnetic susceptibility and something called chemical shift um, these two affect the value of b0 locally in the sense we saw we know b0 is a function of r let's say if we write this as a function of r and time we don't we'll exclude time of r now we expect this to be b0 everywhere but there'll be some delta b because of these two properties and actually this this is exploited for imaging right because you will see later that because this b this, this b0 varies uh, consequently this omega naught will also be slightly different and that's what is used for obtaining contrast okay um, so the groups of nuclei in a spin system that are the same large uh, frequency are called isochromats so the hydrogen nuclei in water will form an isochromat while those in fa uh, fa fat will form another isochromat because it might have a different, slightly different uh, normal frequency because B0 is slightly modified because of the uh, chemical surrounding. Sorry, I used a wiper instead of uh, right here, B0. Okay. All right. Next. So, we will also now look at some nomenclature. Okay. Transverse and longitudinal magnetization. Where do these come from? Right. So, the M as we saw has two components. We, as we can think of them as having two components. One is longitudinal component which is along the direction of the static magnetic field. Remember, the direction of the static magnetic field we said will be typically along B0. Okay. That is that is basically B0 direction is also taken as the uh, Z axis, but typically that is how it is. right? And uh, Mx and My, which is we saw, right? there is an equation of motion for Mx and y, My and there is actually sinusoidal dependence. right? And that component in plane component as we call it is we call mxy. mxy is written in complex form like this mx plus jmy this actually simplifies a lot of the analysis that is why they write it. And then there is a direction which is basically an initial direction which is uh, tan inverse my by mx. Right? Um, so uh, this is basically this particular angle I guess you can look at it that way. Hmm? So this alpha I have indicated here typically there is a 
you know uh, you would assume that there is some tilt away from the axis and then it's processing around it so even with just a static magnetization a uh, magnetic field um, applied uh, you know in along the z axis uh, the spins the individual spins align preferentially along the direction of the static magnetic field and they also process around the direction of the uh, static magnetic field there's an arbitrary phase associated with it okay now this is what i was trying to uh, you know show um, imply in the, from the previous slide so you can think of individual uh, nuclei or you know the protons in this case these are think of these are hydrogen atom protons right because they are the most abundant in the body and they have this spin property and the spin is basically uh, you know think of it as you know as contributing uh, and in fact that's what uh, you know gives rise to the magnetic properties of the, of the material so you can think of it as like some compass pointing on a particular direction right that's what is indicated here and it can and the direction with which it points is the direction of the magnetization induced you can think of it that way and when there is no magnetic no no uh, static magnetic field all these are uh, randomly uh, you know aligned leading to a net magnetization of zero now in the presence of a static magnetic field you would have you know the um, the all of them preferentially aligned along the direction so the net alignment is along the direction okay and which is what is shown here in this figure you see that most of them are pointing upwards and uh, and therefore if we take a component along the direction of b0 field there is always a component along the direction of b0 field okay and you'll also see that the you can you can say that you know since they're pointing in orbit directions the transverse component might cancel and become zero so generally there is only a component pointing along the direction and there is a precession right so which means that if you think of this as a net magnetization net magnetization right and this processes around the direction of the magnetic field so that's the uh, that's the general setup for an mr experiment or an mr imaging experiment so you are your sample is basically a human patient or for that matter, matter any other tissue sample or biological sample it's it's placed in a static magnetic field pointing along the z axis and consequently all the magnetic spins um, uh, or the nuclear magnetic spins are aligned preferentially along the direction of the static magnetic field and there is a precession also and this is the initial setup so then how do we uh, how do we make the measurement where does the measurement come from right so that's what we want to do so this is the uh, picture so this is a precession uh, that we talked that i was talking about so there is a b0 field um, along the z axis these are the individual let's say uh, magnetic spins which are in general processing around the direction of the magnetic field right now if you think about it then you can uh, you can of course um, do a vector sum and have like one arrow uh, processing uh, so there will be a component along z and there is a in plane component which is the x y plane component which is like this if you think uh, one component which will also be processing okay in a particular direction we saw there is an x y component right the b the the z direction there is a there is an mz comp there is a sorry there is a mz component which is along this direction and there is a mxy component here okay so this m this magnetization which is rapidly rotating with the frequency mu zero the proportional to nu zero sorry in the plane and if you put like a coil of wire here right appropriate coils of wire here it will induce a current it will induce a current in this right and that current is your okay the the uh, nmr signal what is the origin of that nmr signal right that's that's what we are looking for so the xy component as we saw uh, we, we go back to the previous slide xy component let we saw mx and my have a sinusoidal dependence and we can write it in this form where this mu zero comes right this mu zero is the larmor frequency that we saw okay this this means that in the plane in the plane as i indicated earlier the mxy component is rotating rapidly okay now in the in there is since there is a rotating magnetization if we place a coil of wire outside the sample then this rotating magnetization can be measured okay and this is exactly what is used in an nmr signal okay it is was used in nmr MR, this is the origin of the nmr signal right so this magnetization let me go back here signal okay um, so the signal frequencies in nmr this new zero it turns out to be very so it's in the radio frequency range okay megahertz radio frequency range and um, so then the radio waves are generated by the coils and in fact there is one more step that we'll get to where we actually need to generate a radio wave in order to measure uh, another radio wave frequency okay um, 
so there are there is how do we so how do we know how do we associate a signal we are measuring to this quantity here that's the important part right so we saw that you know we have um, we have a net magnetization because of the static magnetic field there is a x ray it's processing around the direction of the static magnetic field there is a component in plane you know one in plane in the sense there is a the, you can split that magnetization into two components where it's a vector one component along the direction of the magnetic field another one perpendicular to it the one perpendicular to it is what we can measure okay and that can be measured by because it's it's actually um, rapidly changing as a function of time we can place a coil of wire and it will induce a current in it and that current can be measured now we want to now associate have an also you know uh, relate this the signal that we are measuring that current induced or voltage induced emf as it's called and the magnetization um, and that that relationship will then help us to map the magnetization across the volume okay um so whether we won't get into the details but what we can do is we can actually derive an expression for a rapidly rotating magnetization cutting across a coil okay so there's a coil of wire something like this multiple coils and then there is a B, uh, there is a m field right m magnetization which is rapidly moved. every time it rotates it cuts across the coil of wires this will generate a signal in the wire okay now which this will involve you know integrating across the area of the coil okay so you will be measuring a net magnetization and you know you will have to integrate across the area of the coil now this is a problem okay so um, just give you a qualitative reasoning see measuring net magnetization is pointless right because what we want is we want spatial localization right that's what an image is right remember for ct images we were able to um, you know um, localize density differences right because when you reconstruct your, the signal is proportional to the density this mu is a function of energy uh, the the linear attenuation coefficient that we reconstructed is actually a function of um, uh, the energy as well as the density of the object right? the atomic number so similarly the net if we do this particular analysis wherein we, we keep a coil of wire and if you do the analysis like you you, uh, you integrate across the area of the uh, of the coil that is typically what you would do because you want you want to calculate the flux you end up doing that but that doesn't help because you will be only able to measure one quantity which is the net magnetization what we want is magnetization as a function of r time where r is in the sample let's say the human body on every position we want to be able to localize right so there is something called the principle of reciprocity which lets you rewrite that integral in terms of a volume integral of m okay so the rate of uh, you know the change of the flux which is the derivative of the flux across the coil that can be uh, rewritten as a volumetric integral of the magnetization okay and that that is called the principles of principle of reciprocity once again this is just for qualitative understanding you don't have to get into the details i'll just show you the expression that is involved and in the end what is more important is yes i to understand what the mr signal that one is measuring what is it proportional to right what influences that signal that's what we're heading towards qualitatively understand that part okay so if you look at this for the mxy uh, we uh, is proportional to this this is the signal we have we saw that right we saw we solve that ode if you solve the ode for uh, uh, for um, uh, uh, for the magnetization or the angular momentum then you get expressions for mx and ny which were sinusoidal dependence okay so you can put them together as mxy right in complex form and the induced voltage in the coil of wire can be written in this form where m is the magnetization so this is a vector dot product so both of them things are vector and br is the um, you know this is the uh, magnetic field produced by the receive coil the coil that you are using to uh, measure it's called the receive coil and this is the magnetic magnetic field produced by the receive coil at a position r the same position r due to a unit current once again we won't go into the details of this derivation i will just to give you an idea of uh, you know how we are going to proceed with the analysis right so it turns out then after you act we can actually make some simplifying assumptions and in the end if you look at the magnitude of the um, voltage induced magnitude of the volt signal induced it is proportional to this nu zero which is the it is done is the lambda frequency this is what you call the voxel volume in this case it's an infinitesimal volume okay you think of this as a volume over which the magnetic field is constant static magnetic field is constant or m is constant uh, m zero which is the induced magnetization the magnitude right and sin alpha sin alpha is the tilt from the axis right remember we have this we show this picture this is the z axis and this is the induced magnetization and it's at an angle alpha okay 
So this is this can be maximized. So it depends on all of this. So if you have very high M0, the signal is very high. If nu0 is high, signal is very high. Alpha is high. Alpha maximum alpha is pi over 2. Okay. So if alpha is pi over 2, which means that you have you are actually your entire you flip the and magnetization is actually in the plane in this direction, then your signal is very high. So the next step is in order to get a good signal, what uh, what is done is to tip this magnetization, which is now processing around the direction of the static magnetic field, tip it into the plane, which is perpendicular to the uh, the plane perpendicular to the direction of the static magnetic field. So that is the uh, you know that is how you would uh, actually induce the MR signal that you typically get in all these exp uh, you know imaging uh, experiments. Okay. Okay. Um, so there is one other um, concept you will come across. I will just briefly touch up on it. It's called the rotating frame of reference, right? So if you look um, the uh, the if you tip, let's say the magnetic uh, the M X Y component is in the plane, right? It is processing at a frequency nu zero. This is a very high frequency, okay? Radio frequency range. On the other hand, you can actually let the uh, coordinate system rotate at this. Frequency. If you get the coordinate system rotated at this frequency, then your magnetization is basically it, it's not it, it's not moving, right? Or you can it's not rotating or anything. It is just some vector with up this magnitude. Stationary vector with a magnitude and a phase angle. That's all it reduces to. Okay. So um, so so this is the idea. So but this actually simplifies you know analysis quite a bit. So that's why people use uh, rotating frames of reference when you're working on. Um, you know, M analyzing MR signals. So, in order to generate like a good MR signal, we have to tip this magnetization vector. We saw M into the plane. We saw that, right? It's proportional to sine alpha. Alpha is pi by two is maximum. So, you make it nine. So, you flip it into the uh, tip that magnetization into the plane. You get very good signal. How do you tip this magnetization? Uh, this is where this nuclear magnetic resonance aspect comes in. Okay. Okay. So, the way the tipping is done is by applying an RF signal. So the energy for tipping the uh, magnetization into the plane is is provided by a R, by a RF signal. So there is another coil which generates a magnetic field. It's called the B1 field. I don't mention it here. And this B1 field, uh, incidentally, also uh, is oscillating at the Larmor frequency. Why do we need that? If you think about it, let's say you apply the B1 field at an arbitrary frequency uh, at an arbitrary frequency but its b1 field is always perpendicular to the b0 field if b0 is along z axis b1 let's say will be along the x this is the b1 field now what happened we saw right so uh, we we saw that m cross b the the, and the torque is m cross b so when you apply this b1 this will also produce a torque however the b0 field is always much stronger this b1 field is much much lesser than B zero field, so it won't uh, it it won't be able to so the, uh, you know to influence that uh, magnetization that much because the B zero field will eventually also have a torque on it. It becomes an issue. So the way to do that is by uh, by doing something in resonance, which is basically applying this rapidly oscillating B zero field, which oscillates at the same frequency B of nu zero. Okay, the the uh, the idea is if the B one field also oscillates, then it will rapidly. Uh, over, over push the magnetization into the plane okay so that that's where the resonance aspect comes the resonance the is called resonance imaging because the applied b1 field which you applied at right angles to the b0 field uh, will will get, will put a torque on it which will force the magnetization into the plane but however it will not be it will not be enough right because the b0 field is always stronger okay so then you have to do it at a certain frequency nu zero. This oscillating field has to be at frequency nu zero in order for it to tip. Okay, and the tip angle is generally given by this expression zero to. It depends on how much time you apply. So B one field is not permanent like the B zero field. You apply it for a specific period of time. That period of time determines how much by, by what angle you tip the magnetization. It is given by this integral expression. Okay, again this gamma will be there as a prefix. All right. So what's essentially happening is if you look at it in the rotating frame of reference this is your net magnetization let's say initially it's along z just for the sake of uh, argument for illustration it's along z and uh, again i use x prime y prime z prime it doesn't matter there it, it just i might just mean x y z okay um, so it's along z 
and then you you apply this b1 field remember let's say i applied it along b1 then it will tip the magnetization into the plane which is into this plane okay on the other hand uh, or depending on the duration right if you if you want to dip into the plane you have to apply it for a proportional period of time uh, but if you look at it from the laboratory laboratory frame of reference what you are doing is you are um, uh, it's actually spiraling the m is actually spiraling into the plane okay the magnetization is spiraling into the plane if you look at it in a rotating frame of reference then it's actually uh, um, it's spir- uh, the it, it's just tipping into the plane okay now if from the laboratory frame of reference you can understand this right it's spi- it is spiraling because the uh, applied b1 field also has the same frequency as the um, uh, precession frequency of the m okay it is just like when you are swing right you are somebody on a swing uh, you have to time your push properly so that you know uh, next time they go or they go back and forth they get a higher displacement it's very similar to that okay so now uh, so this is where the actual imaging signals start to arise correct so once you have tipped it into the plane what then okay so once the magnetization is tipped you would think right once you have magnetization tipped you will turn off the b1 field b1 field is set to zero okay so ideally if you leave it that way it should process there forever correct because initially you had um, applied a static magnetic field and they were processing along around the direction of the magnetic field now if you tip it then you should have a signal there for it doesn't happen unfortunately because there are physical you know laws and processes at play okay so these physical processes dampen that motion that that uh, precession in the plane and uh, so eventually the in plane uh, the one that the, the magnetization you t- you tipped in plane will decay okay so there are two processes um, that do that lead to that decay so one of them is called the transverse relaxation or spin spin relaxation okay and this causes signal to decay and because of the perturbations in the magnetic field caused by the spins themselves so neighboring spins will modify the uh, b0 field in the uh, you know at a particular spin location okay so then this the that leading to inhomogeneities okay and uh, the way you think of it is defacing is you know if you think of a bunch of spins processing around the you know in plane and each of those spins will cause some inhomogeneity somewhere else right and that means that the magnetic field there is either reduced or increased and subsequently the the spins at that location will get either a higher frequency or a lower frequency leading to defacing okay only if they are all process processing in phase do you get um you know you, you get a strong signal otherwise the signal goes to zero okay now the process now once you tipped it starts going to zero but still you can get a induced signal and that signal is called free induction decay right so the magnetization is tipped into the plane and it's rapidly processing this leads to a, a current current or a voltage that can be measured in a coil and that voltage starts to go, that signal goes to zero rapidly because the uh, the transverse uh, uh, component will decay okay will decay because of the um, so called transverse relaxation process or spin spin relaxation okay so this is what i have shown here in this uh, particular illustration so you have a bunch of spins processing around the direction of static magnetic field you apply this 90 degree r of pulse which is basically your b1 field and it you tip the spin uh, you tip the magnetization into the plane okay but as soon as it's tipped it will start to deface so the individual spins will start to all process with different frequencies in and you know, on and getting different directions and over time they will all spl- there will be so many all of them will get acquire independent uh, you know uh, precision uh, frequencies and phases leading to zero magnetization okay this however this uh, you say this can be measured as a signal this process can be measured as a signal which will rapidly decay to zero okay and that's called the fid free induction decay all right mention that this process is actually characterized by the time constant t2 the process is is time constant t2 so this is where the t2 contrast comes from okay the second uh, before we go any further i just want to the other form of relaxation is the longitudinal relaxation which is basically the reappearance of the uh, you know longitudinal magnetic right? you have the mz component right now we have tipped it so then after immediately after tipping mz will, will go to zero but then over time it will slowly start to reappear okay so but then that process again uh, this is not may not be count uh, very uh, obvious at this time or not very intuitive the rate at which mxy goes to zero and the rate at which mz reappear or are, are different okay so they have different time constants so that one is t2 this time constant is given by t1 
okay and for different types of tissue the t1 and t2 have different ranges so t1 is the always higher t1 ranges from 250 to 2500 milliseconds while t2 ranges from 25 to 250 so just to remember for the sake of uh, uh, you know understanding t2 is the uh, is the time constant which which uh, which determines how fast your transverse magnetization which you have tipped into the plane the how fast that goes to zero because this is the time constant for the processes that drive that component to zero however that doesn't mean that you recover uh, the magnetization along the uh, z axis or the, along the direction of the static magnetic field instantaneously that takes a slightly longer time and that time constant is t1 so this t1 and t2 or those time constants they are they depend on the properties of the uh, you know isochromates okay where are they i mean in a sense you know uh, what kind of tissue are imaging you know, um, you know what kind of atom or nuclei you are imaging right so in this case in the body it's just hydrogen hydrogen proton that's a nuclei you are imaging uh, but then the its chemical environment will determine the t1 and t2 okay so for all this put together look like remember we wrote this equation you know this uh, kind of uh, m cross b equal to dj by dt is uh, is something we wrote for you know just a uh, magnetization in a static magnetic field now if we take into account uh, there is actually a bracket i left out here so this is a bracket here right there yes now if you take into account all these factors that we talked about and we talk about, and we also include b0 and b1 right so then we can write down the equations of motion these are called the block equations in this fashion so these are two differential equation that that did that uh, that show how mx and my evolve in the presence of once uh, you know in the present these equations this in the presence of uh, b0 and b1 and this is after b1 is removed how does it behave that this determine after b1 is removed that's when we start the imaging process correct and uh, that's these equations then determine you know your source of contrast you know what how, how what your signal depends on etc so uh, these are used to actually figure out different types of imaging tricks they are called sequences in magnetic resonance imaging all right so the first um, uh, um sequence sequence that we are going to talk about again this is just for the sake of understanding what's what exactly is happening um this is called a sequence an imaging sequence which basically uh, what we are trying to do is manipulate this magnetization m right one way we saw how to manipulate this we tipped it into the plane that's when we have the coils there that measure the induced signal and we use that signal to infer m the magnetization as a as a function of position okay and this is what we want to do and um, so one of the ways of doing that is this spin echo okay we we'll just we'll look at the actual uh, you know 3d imaging sequences in the next video but this is just for the understanding of how the spin echoes are uh, done okay the so spin echo is, so we saw that you apply this 90 degree rf pulse b1 field b1 field in this there along x axis um i think maybe i i should i should done the x differently but anyway just for the sake of an uh, you know, argument we'll just do it this way it you are you apply the b1 field perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field along one of these axes and then it will tip let's say you do a 90 degree pulse okay i call it the 90 degree pulse it 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 will uh, it will tip the the rf pulse which is the b1 field will tip the uh, magnetization into the plane however you can always call it as alpha pulse the alpha is any angle that you want to tip it okay so the 90 degree pulse will tip it in magnetization into the plane the red arrow is the magnetization it will rapidly deface okay but then now what you do is you apply a 180 degree pulse so this 180 degree pulse what it will do is it will flip the magnetization right it will flip the magnetization into this way it's a 180 degree flip from where it is so what happens is they are still uh, processing in the same direction so they will once again come together here and that resets to another signal okay and then followed by a decay so this one will be a decaying signal because you tipped it immediately and then it starts to deface that reads lies to this signal and what you do is you wait at up to a time called uh, te over 2 it's called a time to echo and uh, after that and that you apply 180 degree plus so 90 degree pulse just just understand 90 degree plus will 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 flip the magnetization by 90 degrees 180 degree plus will flip the magnetization by 180 degrees in this case when you flip by 180 degrees you, you actually go the right over there you flip around you can flip along the around the y axis here according to this picture but then you are still processing in the same direction you are all processing in different directions right so then you will come together once again 
to form another uh, another and gives rise to another signal so that's what is shown here right so you go uh, once you get this other signal it's rising because you come together and then you will decay again so this is the spin echo okay and uh, the uh, the 180 degree pulse is applied at time t from t by 2 from the time you apply the 90 degree pulse and then you will measure the echo at time t e okay so time to echo so this is one parameter that people manipulate all the time time to echo okay when you measure the signal t e okay will determine your contrast we will see that in the later slides um so it determine the contrast there's one more time which is called tr that's called repetition time so for instance in all of these experiments it's not like you just do this once and then let's like say you're done no you will have to do these sequences in order uh, several times the time between each time and uh, time between each of these uh, very crudely speaking the time between each of these 90 degree pulses every time uh, you you have to apply 90 degree plus to to uh, sh- sh- to flip the um, magnetization in plane so which and that time between two successive these 90 degree pulses you can call it time to repetition okay so this t and t r determine contrast okay so we'll see that um, how that happens so there are t- different forms of contrast we saw that earlier also i mentioned it t1 t2 and pd we'll see how that is okay so the basic contrast mechanisms right um, the type uh, and ordering of excitations and relative timing that leads to different type of tissue contrasts okay and uh, this is what is specified using a pulse sequence okay all right so this pulse sequence determines <coughs> what kind of contrast you are getting okay the time interval like i said between two successive alpha pulses is the time rep- time to repetition we saw what is the time to echo last the last slide okay see, see only the transverse magnetization provides the measurable signal okay so larger the transverse component higher the signal okay and if you want to see contrast in different types of tissue the measured signal must be different in these tissues right that's how we do right the, the magnetization that you measure in these different tissue types should be different because we saw that the signal magnitude of v remember that expression last a few slides ago it depends on m0 so whether if m0 is different then you get good contrast if they are the same you don't get contrast okay so the contrast is provided by three main properties we saw proton density proton density understandable right because as to, if there are more protons you get a bigger m0 right because each of those protons contributes to their net magnetization and there is a t1 and t2 weighted time so we saw what t1 was t1 was the rate at which you recover the lang- longitudinal magnetization okay and that is a tissue dependent property okay it depends on the uh, you know chemical uh, or the uh, biochemical uh, constitution of that particular tissue and t2 also same thing it is a chemical property right because you are looking at how fast does the fins deface in the plane and that depends on you know the kind of inhomogeneity is introduced by other spins in there and that depends again once again on the chemical composition of the tissue at hand so both of these are tissue dependent these properties and we can capture these properties by playing with tr and te this other property is te how so image all right so proton density weighted imaging and this is accomplished by long tr or uh, and either no echo or short t right why do we do that see if there are if you wait long enough right so long tr is between two successive pulse sequences that is a time tr so before you apply the f- second pulse you wait for the longitudinal magnetization to recover completely now different tissue will have different t1 times which means that the amount of magnetization that is recovered for different tissues will be let's say there are two different types of tissue right i'll do red and blue and let's say green this blue and red this one is t this let's say this is 100 milliseconds um, or 1000 milliseconds this is 2000 milliseconds right this is t1 let's say it's t2 is this is uh 20 milliseconds this is milliseconds and this is 40 or in this case 5 milliseconds okay okay so the idea is if we wait long enough we don't wait long enough let's say we start the second uh experiment second pulse alpha pulse at uh, immediately at with the first alpha pulse at time 0 second alpha pulse let's say we apply at uh, at 1000 milliseconds right then what happens is that in this tissue 
the longitudinal magnetization has not recovered correct longitudinal magnetization has not recovered here but it has recovered there so consequently the m0 that we measure m0 that we measure will be higher from this tissue compared to that right similarly for the t2 time t2 determines how fast it goes to zero okay so if you measure soon if you if your time to echo is very short is is only short now let's say in this case let's say it's only 5 milliseconds right you will you won't be able to capture this one right this signal because this is what dissipated by that time let's say your measuring time to echo was 5 milliseconds then all of this um, the contribution from this tissue would have would have dissipated by 5 milliseconds why you will only get the 20 millisecond component right so <clears throat> the idea is we don't want that to happen we want it to strictly depend on the density of the protons in each of them so what you do you wait long enough let's say you wait for 5000 milliseconds which means that the longitudinal magnetization would have recovered in both of these tissue sets right and then once you flip you measure immediately which means that you don't in this both this t2 times will also will not influence your measurement right so that's how you get a proton density weighted image so like i said t2 weighted contrast you know difference in t2 relaxation times must be apparent okay so which means that t must be selected to be t2 value of the image of the tissue being imaged and uh, we should have large tr to reduce uh, t1 effects right so we need a large tr so that the t1 um, factor is not shown so all the magnetization in all the tissue will recover large tr but if you want uh, if you want to have a uh, you know just want to get t2 then you just measure at at some you know at the tissue for instance should be approximately selected to be t2 of the tissue being imaged so you can you can either choose let's say you want at t2c if you wait uh, too long all of them will go to zero right if you wait too long to measure all of this will deface let's say 5 and millisecond and 20 milliseconds if you wait 40 milliseconds this the spins from both of them would have gone to zero so you won't get a, so you won't be able to would have gone to almost close to zero or be very low you won't be able to make the difference so you want to measure this tissue means you take you take the uh, time to echo as 5 milliseconds and measure that okay t1 mated contrast same thing um where you you make sure tr must be set approximately close to t1 so in this case if you want to measure this tissue you set it to you set tr to 1000 which means that only that tissue would have recovered so we'll get a high signal from there okay so that's the um, idea behind um, you know how you get different types of uh, contrast okay so you have to think about it a bit so understand that t1 is the time constant for the recovery of longitudinal magnetization T2 is the time constant for the dissipation of the uh, transverse magnetization. Remember that the transverse magnetization is what gives rise to the signal. And the transverse magnetization is actually from the longitudinal magnetization because that is what you tip into the plane. Okay? So, the larger your longitudinal magnetization, the higher your, uh, your transverse after the application of the R of pulse. Okay, so that's all for this class. So the understanding here, okay, just to summarize, the idea is you have, uh, you know, all these um, proton nuclei, uh, protons in our body from the hydrogen atom nucleus. They all have a spin angular momentum property, which can interact with the static uh, uh, magnetic field, very high value static magnetic field, and which leads lies to a net magnetization. This magnetization. Um, processes around the direction of the static magnetic field with a certain characteristic frequency called the Larmor frequency which is mu zero or nu zero. Then upon the application of another or rapidly oscillating magnetic field and I say rapidly oscillating I mean it is the same frequency as the Larmor frequency that you are trying to uh, of the material you are trying to measure. So the, upon the application of that these the processing magnetization is tipped into the plane okay we call that the transverse magnetization. And once again, it's still uh, processing at um, the alarm of frequency, giving rise to a signal in a coil of wire. Okay, and there are these three important factors that determine the strength of the signal, which are basically the uh, T1 relaxation time, T2 relaxation time, and proton density. By appropriately tuning your time to repetition, which is the time between two successive alpha pulses, and the time to echo. Time to echo is the time from the application of the alpha pulse to the measurement of the signal in your coil of wire by changing those times you can um, make sure that uh, either the proton density is uh, um, uh, is what contributes mostly to the image contrast uh, 
or it's only the t2 times the difference in t2 relaxation times is what contributes to the contrast or so the difference in t1 relaxation times okay um once again before i conclude i would make that point that these are relative right so when you say t1 relaxation time you are not be going to be able to absolutely measure 1000 millisecond from the voxel values so if something has a for instance of just as a illust uh, example if some uh, um, 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 part of the tissue has a higher relaxation time uh, maybe depending on the tr it will appear dark the lower relaxation time t1 relaxation time might appear bright okay similarly for te now if you depending on how soon you do these measurements right the uh, lower te might appear darker higher te might appear brighter okay so this is why you know and of course proton density once again is also relative um, the higher you can all only see relative contrast in the sense something is darker means there is either more or less protons than the other uh, other regions okay so this but but then if you look this kind of gives you the flexibility to do multiple different contrast mechanisms that's why mr is uh, is one of the you know um, kind of highly researched uh, um, you know imaging modality because the the modes of contrast are huge i only talked about two or three different three different these are the most commonly done but there are other contrast mechanisms also that can be done and uh, that is a lot of interesting research going on in the area okay thank you that's all for this class